Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everyone, again, and thanks for joining uh, us on today's webinar. As Ashley said, my name is Brandon Burke. I am the Policy and Outreach Director with the Business Network for Offshore Wind. And a fun fact about myself, in a past life, I was a trial attorney. In my current role with the network, I help shape and drive the network's business development and policy strategy, both at the state and federal levels. And I also work closely with the network's overseas partners to advance the offshore wind industry, both here in the United States and internationally. I also host the network's podcast, Offshore Wind Insider, so be sure to check that out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on the network's website, which is offshorewindus.org. The Business Network for Offshore Wind is the only 501c3 nonprofit organization that's solely focused on the development of the U.S. offshore wind industry and the advancement of its supply chain. We're not a trade association of many voices. We're one leading voice for the offshore wind business community. The network brings together developers, policymakers, academia, global experts, and hundreds of member businesses, including Wombledon Dickinson, for critical discussions and unmatched networking opportunities. And one final introductory note, the network's signature annual event, the International Offshore Wind Partnering Forum, or IPF, is the largest annual offshore wind conference in the United States. On April 21st and 22nd, next week, we will be hosting the IPF in a virtual format, where the network will deliver the time-sensitive content that you need to plan your business strategy in the ever-evolving U.S. offshore wind sector. Then, in August 8th, uh, from August 18th to 21st, the network will host IPF together in Providence, Rhode Island. This will feature the additional elements that the IPF is known for, plenaries, more workshops, the trade show exhibit hall, wind match, and other networking opportunities such as our new career match job fair and tours and other things. With, that introductory, with those introductory items said, we have an esteemed panel joining us for today's webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Joe Tavroni. Joe's practice focuses on energy project and infrastructure development, mergers and acquisitions, and project finance. He is the co-leader of Wombelbond Dickinson's energy and natural resources sector. His client work comprises structuring, negotiating, and drafting a range of contracts and agreements for companies in the energy sector. Joe also serves on the board for the Business Network for Offshore Wind. Also joining us is Belton Ziegler. Drawing on more than 30 years of energy industry experience, Belton provides clients with solutions to complex energy, utility, environmental, and cybersecurity matters. Belton co-leads Wombelbond Dickinson's energy and natural resources sector. Belton has served as general counsel to a major electric and national ga natural gas utility and has worked extensively in state level regulation of nuclear power, solar projects, as well as other renewable power projects. And last but not least, we have Lisa Rushton with us. An industry leading environmental transactions attorney, Lisa guides corporate clients, including real estate developers, financial institutions, and investment funds on matters relating to federal, state, and local environmental health and safety laws and regulations. Clients rely on Lisa's advice and due diligence to understand environmental issues relevant to corporate and real estate transactions, debt and equity financings, public offerings, and bankruptcy proceedings. So we have a great panel for you today, and I'd like to thank Joe, Belton, and Lisa for taking the time to share their insights. And now I'll turn the program over to Belton Ziegler. Thank you, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Business Network for hosting this and all the participants for making their time available for what we have to say. Lisa, Joe, and I are going to provide two uh, elements of the program. Uh, one is an overview of where things are in light of the coronavirus uh, response. And the other is to um, look at regulatory developments that have occurred uh, prior to uh, the coronavirus uh, becoming the topic of the day. Regulatory developments that will have an impact on offshore wind going forward. As part of the coronavirus uh, response, Joe will talk from his expertise in uh, contracts and project development on the uh, contractual matters related to um, dealing with the delays and disruptions of coronavirus, uh, and uh, we will be going in some detail on that. Um, we'll then deal with three uh, issues that predate the coronavirus matter. One are the environmental policy changes related to NEPA, which is the primary regulatory um, statute for environmental matters related to offshore wind. Lisa will cover that. Um, then I will discuss um, Two things. One are the one is the uh, FERC's new NOPR um, 
rulings related uh, specifically to PJM. There have also been uh, related rulings for ISO New England and ISO New York, but we'll focus on the PJM one, I think, which is the most most comprehensive and interesting of them. We'll also talk about some Jones Act matters related to Customs and Border Security issuing new uh, regulatory guidance on the Jones Act. So let's talk about initially where we see the industry in light of the coronavirus response. And this is based on conversations with a number of players throughout uh, the world who are dealing with the offshore wind industry, particularly in the United States. The Overall message is uh, op is guardedly optimistic. Luckily, the industry has uh, encountered this coronavirus issue at a time when most of the key analyses can proceed on a desktop basis. We are still in the pre-construction environmental stage on most projects, and particularly the Vineyard Wind Project, which is the lead project in the United States. As to Vineyard Wind, the key uh, field work has been completed. There's nothing that uh, needs to be done that can't be done relatively efficiently uh, in isolation uh, using social distancing. And the general expectation is it will be possible for BOEM to issue a draft record of decision in the Vineyard Wind case for the end of the summer, probably late summer, and for the Vineyard Wind um, supplemental uh, EIS to be completed by the end of the year. Um, one concern that we have heard uh, voiced is what's the effect of the lockdown going to be on stakeholder process? It doesn't appear that there's any uh, requirement for in-person stakeholder process to complete the permitting work uh, on the EIS. All this can happen uh, through written comments and so that should not be an issue. The next set of issues concerns the um, question of these construction and operating permits that are uh, going to be the follow-ons to Vineyard Winds. And the question there is whether summer environmental field work can proceed in light of the social distancing and other requirements. Uh, there's no clear picture as to what that looks like at this point. Um, it's a question of how social distancing will play itself out in a broad range of activities, including shipboard activities, survey vessels. International travel restrictions will also play a role since this is a global industry. There are questions about the availability of specialized electronic equipment that are needed for some of these activities and whether the supply chain coming out of Asia will be disrupted. But at present, there doesn't seem to be any um, any reason to assume that um, there won't be workarounds found for these things, but there is a question mark hanging over that issue. Another set of questions, which uh, is again a little further down the road, is what will the stakeholder requirements look like as you move out of the federal area into state and local activities? In many cases, um, coastal zone management decisions and decisions of local permitting um, bodies as well as local public service commissions uh, will have to take place uh, before projects can be built. And so we'll need to, um, on a project by project level, and in some cases, uh, a state and local government by government basis, look at what sort of flexibility there is to avoid in-person stakeholder activities in this process. The um, case of the Edgartown Conservation Commission and the processes there is an example of what I'm talking about in terms of local government involvement that um, could be could be troubling later on. When projects meet reach the stage of requiring transmission uh, and substation real property, there will be a question about social distancing in the acquiring of property rights. Uh, typically, that is very much a face-to-face, person-to-person activity. But I think we're um, we're not picking up on any concerns that that can't be done on a reasonable basis. Moving to the more commercial side of things from the uh, permitting side, it does seem that project development activities are continuing apace in that lead developers are using this time to conduct solicitations uh, to, 
for suppliers and service providers. They're putting their project teams together. RFPs are being issued and answered. Awards are being considered. And this uh, activity seems to be moving forward very um, briskly in um, the current context. Probably the most interesting comment I heard in my conversations was one uh, European colleague who said that there's a silver lining to this, that um, the new normal will involve increased receptivity to virtual teamwork. And that will make it easier for global industry to bring the best talent to the table for a project, regardless of where that talent is located. Uh, highly dispersed work teams becoming more accepted may be a very helpful thing for an industry that is uh, as global as offshore wind is. Another bright spot is the possibility that as we emerge from um, the current lockdown, the United States will adopt federal in infrastructure, infrastructure incentives that may include um, some regulatory and financial incentives to accelerate offshore wind development. We can certainly hope. Uh, the business network for offshore wind is diligently pursuing that and is working hard to be sure that offshore wind isn't left out if there is a, a, a um, piece of federal infrastructure legislation of that sort. That's my assessment of the key issues we're hearing in the industry right now because of coronavirus. I'll now turn it over to my colleague Joe Taroni to talk about uncertainty in the supply chain and how from a legal and contractual standpoint, uh, you might want to think about that uncertainty and your responses to it. Joe? Thank you, Belton. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, hope that everyone uh, on the call and is staying safe, healthy, and managing this unique time of social distancing and uh, government restrictions. As we uh, in the industry and all industries look at at how the effects of the COVID-19 issues are affecting our industry, our contractual relations, and our, and our businesses, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, I'm gonna review briefly um, some of the major points, including force majeure, uh, the common law principles of impossibility, impracticability, and frustration of purpose, and briefly, some other contractual issues such as change in law, material adverse change, material adverse effect, your default termination, dispute resolution provisions, and insurance policies, just all things that, that need to be looked at um, as we're analyzing the effects of the cascading delays and restrictions that we're all working under. Next slide, please. Well, let's first off look at at how we're going to manage our contracts in the, in and in, in this crisis. Um, obviously, the the first and number one priority has to be the health and safety of your staff, your counterparties, um, and and the general public. Um, I, I think is a uh, point of public policy and how people's actions are going to be interpreted. It's it's likely that that uh, that the considerations made by parties to protect the health and safety of their workers and others are going to be considered um, uh, as important factors in looking at their um, their actions. First, you have to look at and determine how you're affected by these restrictions. Are you unable to perform? Is it your counterparties that are unable to perform? Often, it's both. Um, as uh, members in a supply chain, you often are receiving performance from a, a party further down in the chain and uh, performing for those further up in the chain. Um, and often the delays and other, uh, other problems in the contracts have a knock-on effect moving up. So obviously the first thing you need to do once you've made the determination that you are affected is to carefully re uh, read your agreements, understand what the problems are. Um, in almost all circumstances, you'll have a uh, a obligation to reasonably mitigate any effects of um, of the delay or other um, inability to perform. And um, you know, a bit of a shameless plug for 
uh, counsel everywhere. I, I think it's important that that you talk with either your in-house or your uh, outside counsel in order to uh, compile a consistent and uh, and informing uh, way to move forward as you look to uh, to addressing these issues. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to talk about force majeure because um, this is something that is is coming up quite a bit um, lately. Um, and as many of you know, force majeure is a contractual defense that allows affected parties to suspend or cancel their their performance under their contracts and and relieve them of liability under certain circumstances. Um, the, the if if your contract includes a force majeure clause, which uh, many, many do. Um, really, what constitutes an event of force majeure is the important analysis, and and that depends highly on the uh, the applicable contractual provisions, applicable law, and the facts surrounding the circumstance. Um, most force majeure provisions include a list of specified events uh, that are not reasonably foreseeable and are outside the control of the affected parties. That's uh, a sort of very generic definition of what force majeure is. Next slide, please. Examples of uh, of a listing is uh, include things such as act of God. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, natural disasters or, or, or catastrophes such as floods, fire, earthquake, explosion, In certain um, certain areas, hurricanes or tornadoes, um, are also included uh, war, invasion, hostilities, terrorist defense, civil unrest. Um, another category which is important with COVID-19 are government orders, laws, or actions. Um, often embargoes or blockades are talked about. National or regional emergency, which is, could be relevant here as well. Strikes, labor stoppages, or slowdowns. Um, and importantly, uh, often they include a, a catch-all along the lines of other similar events beyond the reasonable control of the affected party. Sometimes force majeure clauses also include specific exclusions, such as uh, limiting, uh, excluding local strikes or labor actions. For instance, a strike just on, on your work site would normally, um, it would often be uh, uh, ex not excused for force majeure. Financial or market disruptions, such as the the market disruption in 2008 or or the any sort of market disruptions we may be dealing with now could be arguably excluded. Um, and sometimes specifically increased costs of performance are excluded. Um, and typically in almost all the clauses, just the uh, ability to pay money is usually not excluded. So it's usually the contractual performance other than paying money that is subject to uh, to force majeure uh, relief. Next slide, please. So everyone's, the thought on everyone's mind now is whether COVID-19 is an event of force majeure. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, to a certain extent, this is all very fact-based and depends on the contract, but I can speak in generalities based on, on what most of the uh, provisions look like. Um, in some force majeure provisions, um, they do include ep epidemics, pandemics, and quarantines. It's uncommon now. I think going forward, we're going to see them in, in, uh, in, in force majeure provisions going forward being addressed one way or the other to allocate that risk. Um, but usually uncommon now. Um, more likely, you'd need to fit it into the act of God, government order, law, or action, or, or, or some other um, catch-all of uh, similar events beyond the reasonable control of the affected party. Um, if you are prevented from performing by a government stay-at-home order, uh, uh, anti uh, orders against uh, uh, people, you know, groups of more than 10 people, um, shutting down of businesses, that is a fairly strong indication that it's impossible to perform. Um, Act of God, um, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion as to whether a pandemic fits into Act of God. I think you have a, uh, I think there's a reasonably good argument. Um, I would certainly include that in the list of, of, uh, reasons why force majeure clause would would 
be applicable. Um, but I think we're likely to see some litigation about this going forward, which will will settle it at least to a to a certain extent. Something key to look at is that the performance must be impossible um, and not just more difficult or expensive. Again, unless there's a provision in the force majeure clause that says otherwise, sometimes the standard is um, is lower than impossibility. If it's silent, it's it's usually in, uh, interpreted as impossible. Um, sometimes they'll have clauses that say um, if it becomes impracticable, which is usually indicates uh, a high degree of difficulty or or uh, unreasonable expense, um, but the standard is impossible to perform. Um, and it's key to note that most courts narrowly interpret force majeure provisions. That's why careful drafting is very important because the courts view this as an allocation of risks among the parties to the contract and they will narrowly, uh, narrowly interpret the provisions. So um, when you're analyzing what you're dealing with, it's important to take a look at that. Uh, next slide, please. Once you've you've determined that that you may or may not have you may have a force majeure claim, um, you know some things that you need to think about are the procedures, the consequences, and other things uh, to look at. Um, the affected party almost always will have a duty to notify their counterparty. Um, usually, you know, uh, if a, it's a fulsomely drafted clause with the description of the force majeure event, the nature of the disruption, the expected duration, and, and sometimes uh, including a, a recovery plan. Um, sometimes notice requirements are strict and late notice is a bar, bar to relief. This is a, this can be a problem with a situation such as uh, as a pandemic, um, you know, if you have a clause that say that says that uh, in order to um, you know a force majeure event must be notified to the counterparty within seven days of its occurrence, um, you know, and if they don't do that, it's a bar to relief. Um, how do you determine when the seven day clock starts with the pandemic? Uh, I think as you talk with your counsel, both in-house and, and outside, um, this is going to be an analysis that uh, that is important in how you document your claim as we have a continuing rolling set of restrictions um, and, and other executive orders and state and local requirements that are changing all the time. So it's going to be very difficult to pin down when this started. Hopefully, um, hopefully with some good documentation that uh, that that this doesn't bar people from relief, which which they should otherwise receive. Um, and you should note that 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 declaring a a, a force majeure event is not um, not without consequences. Uh, ordinarily, uh, a force majeure uh, clause includes a termination right at some point, um, which gives the counterparty the ability to, to terminate the contract if a force majeure event is, is ongoing, continuing after X number of days, whether it's, you know, it can be anywhere. I've seen them as short as 30 days and as long as a year, depending on what the what the contract scope and, and, and uh, nature of the performance is, but there are consequences to calling a, an event a force majeure. Um, also, if if you you notify an event of cult force majeure and it's ultimately determined that that it was not, um, one could argue that you're in breach um, of the contract. Um, you'd be failing to perform in any event, and unless you had another issue, I, I would be less worried about that. But it's it's certainly a a something else to think about. Um, you also have to think about the fact that if you send an uh, send or frankly receive a notice of force majeure, you need to look at your other agreements to see if it triggers a notice requirement. Often in uh, in financing documents, there are notice um, notice covenants that require um, the parties to notify lenders as to um, the receipt of a force majeure provision on a material contract or otherwise. Um, it may be other agreements that you have um, notice requirements. So you need to look at at not just your 
supply and your your performance contract, you need to look at your all of your agreements to see what obligations are affected. Um, you should also take a look to see, you know, part of your analysis is are your force majeure provisions across your contracts. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, often when you receive a notice of force majeure from a, a supplier to yourself, um, that is in, uh, that is has a cascading uh, effect that makes you unable to perform your contracts further up in the supply chain. Um, so it it does have have effects. If your force majeure provisions are inconsistent. Uh, between the contracts that you're receiving and that um, the the contracts in which you're receiving supply and the contracts in which you're granting performance, um, that is something that needs to be reconciled with your counsel and, and your your business people to see how you address these issues. Um, going forward, it's important to try to get these as consistent as possible so you're never in a position where the people supplying you performance are excused, but you are not excused further up the chain. Um, but that's just something to look at. Force majeure in general is uh, is something that's likely to be very applicable right now. We're getting a lot of clients asking us to, to look at these issues and, and moving forward. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now um, and we're happy to discuss any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A on this and uh, or contact afterwards. But we're going to talk about some other uh, contractual and common law issues that might apply here uh, beyond force majeure. Next slide, please. What happens if you if you don't have a force majeure clause in your your contract, or arguably it, you have one? If you have one and it's you don't think it's implicated for uh, the COVID-19 situation, I'd argue at first, please note that, that courts are, are very unlikely to apply um, uh, the common law remedies and equitable remedies relating to, um, uh, to the issues I'm about to talk about if you've already allocated these risks in a force majeure clause. To the extent you don't have one, then we can look at the common law um, equitable concepts of impossibility, impracticability, and frustration of purpose. Um, again, these are very narrowly uh, uh, construed and are um, very state-specific and, and country-specific in how, um, how these are uh, dealt with in, by applicable law. But in general, um, I'll talk about them a little bit. Impossibility. Uh, this is a, a situation where uh, an equitable relief where performance can be excused if it becomes objectively impossible, just not not just more expensive or difficult due to an unfore unforeseen event. You know, the classic example is where you've agreed, entered into a contract to paint someone's house next month, and between now and and the date you are going to paint the house, the house burns down. It is, you know, objectively impossible to paint that house that is burned down, um, and so that the person who otherwise would owe you to pay uh, owe you money to pay the house or damages for not paying um, would be excused. It is objectively impossible to to paint a house that no longer exists. This is, like I said, very narrowly construed, but if it's a a clear cut case like this, um, it it can can come up. The question is whether impossibility uh, claims can be brought up in a case where it is impossible to perform because of government restriction. Um, and I, I think that that to the extent that um, to the extent that that you are prohibited, I think you'd have an argument here um, with the COVID nineteen uh, restrictions in place by government state federal local requirements um, and if you did not have a force majeure clause that allocates these risks i would certainly look to to using impossibility as a as a as a uh, as a 
defense, at least for uh, for an excuse to your performance. Um, very fact specific and uh, applicable law specific. A the much more narrow, um, narrowly applied is impracticability. Um, this comes up under the common law and also in certain six uh, situations where it's the provision of goods where the UCC applies, um, where performance is excused for an unforeseen event that causes performance to become so difficult or expensive that it's impracticable, even if it's technically possible. Um, and it's only where the non-occurrence of such event was, was a basic assumption of the contract. Um, you know, a, a an example of this is where you have a, a development, uh, you're, you're a real estate developer, and you are contracting with someone to remove gravel from a site in order to uh, 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 prep the site for building. Um, and between the, the time that the contract was entered into and the uh, time the performance was expected, the f the site is flooded by a, a hurricane, some sort of natural uh, natural disaster that completely floods the site. And in order to remove the gravel from the site, now it's a, a, a you know a place that's under a few feet of water. It's ten times more expensive to do it that way than just removing it from dry land, which is what was expected. There's an argument there that 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 was impracticable at this point, where where uh, where this is is considered um, an excuse in, in certain jurisdictions. One could make an argument here um, to send in offshore wind if you are technically able to perform in some way. Um, even if it was unreasonably expensive, um, in order to do so, um, one could argue um, to the extent it was applicable that that it was impracticable um, and would fit under this area. This is something to talk about with your counsel to see if it applies. And probably the, the most narrow of the three uh, areas I'm talking about is frustration of purpose. This is a very limited excuse where in some jurisdictions where an unforeseen event completely eliminates the main purpose of the contract. It's certainly possible to still perform, um, but you know, a a under underlying principal purpose of the contract that both parties um, both parties were aware of um, just goes away. Then there's an ability to argue for frustration of purpose. Um, an example of this is uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll think about Tiger King that everybody's been talking about. Imagine if you specifically lease land to put a private tiger zoo in place, um, you know, for three years. Two years into the lease, um, uh, a, a new law comes in that says having a uh, private tiger zoo is illegal and 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 must be shut down. Um, you could argue that that the f sole purpose of the the contract wasn't just to lease facilities; it was to lease facilities for a tiger zoo. So, therefore, the the main purpose that both parties knew is no longer there, and it's frustrated. So, they'd be able to get out. Again, this is very limited um, limited uh, applicability and. Uh, one will need to look at, look at the facts very narrowly to determine how this works. Um, next slide, please. And just very quickly, um, just to talk about other uh, contract provisions that you might want to consider that may may be applicable to the COVID nineteen issues. Uh, often contracts have, uh, especially ones that that have that consider in performance over a longer period of time, include a change in law provision. That the uh, that allocates um, change in law risk among the parties, and certainly um, uh, one could argue that the government orders and restrictions are a, a change in law. Uh, again, you need to look at your contract. 
Many agreements include uh, uh, material adverse change or material adverse effect provisions. Um, you know, these can trigger, trigger defaults or other issues uh, going forward. So that's something to, to think about or termination, right? You should also take a look at your default termination and dispute resolution provisions. Um, you have to be careful to make sure that you don't do anything that triggers a default on your side. Understand what your contractual counterparties are doing to see if they're in default and, and what, whether you need to issue a default notice. Um, and need to look at your dispute resolution provisions to see how well they mesh, uh, mesh up uh, with your whole of contracts, uh, much like the force majeure provisions being consistent, um, it's always best if your dispute resolution provisions are consistent among your your contracts where you're receiving performance and where you're granting performance, so that you could have a a, a unified process in order to go forward. And last but not least, obviously, you should look at your insurance policies to see whether business interruption. Uh, is implicated. Uh, we have a lot of folks looking at their their general commercial liability clauses to determine if um, you know how how this are going to be affected. There are already cases being filed where um, employers or companies are being um, are being uh, at least claims being made that they did not protect their workers or customers from contracting COVID nineteen. People are looking at whether their their CGL policies cover that sort of loss, um, but many of many other issues in your contracts could be affected by the COVID nineteen. Um, I stress for everyone to talk with their in house counsel and their their outside counsel to the extent they they need to, um, and we are always happy and willing to uh, to discussing these issues with you at any time. Um, I'm going to wrap up here. Look forward to answering any questions, and I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Lisa Rushton. Thanks, Joe. Next slide. So, what does COVID-19 mean for offshore wind industry from an environmental perspective? Um, so, while divining regulatory direction is complicated, the Council on Environmental Quality, US EPA, and the Department of Interior have actually provided some recent indicators that may be a bellwether for how COVID-19 may impact environmental issues affecting the renewable industry, and more particularly for our interests here, offshore wind development at the federal level. Um, all three of these agencies, including the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, uh, which is a subsidiary agency of the Department of Interior, were actually subject to a directive from the Office of Management Budget, uh, Office of Management and Budget (OMB) um, that came out on March 17th, which required that these agencies and all other federal agencies actually um, prioritize their activities in order to, and I'll quote here, slow the transmission of COVID-19 while ensuring that mission critical activities continue. End of quote. So, in compliance with this OMB directive, we know that EPA's Office of uh, Enforcement and Compliance, or OECA, issued guidance on March 26, which, um, among other things, indicated that uh, while continued compliance with permits and environmental re uh, regulatory requirements is expected, EPA would relax some of its routine reporting deadlines, and it made provisions for alternate monitoring and compliance procedures. Uh, EPA also issued a guidance actually just this past Friday on uh, uh, April 10th. Um, from the Office of Land and Emergency Management and, and OECA, which basically um, addresses site remediation and on-site activities. And in that um, guidance, they stress that the health and safety of uh, workers at the sites is uh, the highest priority and that EPA wants to be able to respond to emergency situations but that um, any site specific um, activity that's going on needs to be looked at carefully. And if there's stay at home orders or things in place like that, those should be respected. Um, so that just came out actually on Friday. Um, we also are aware and perhaps more importantly for the offshore wind development um, activities is that EPA has reprioritized some of its staff in order to expedite the processing of uh, bringing some new disinfectants and other critical process, processes to market to help combat COVID-19. Um, and so they're kind of reprioritizing, reprioritizing where the staff is focused. We're not sure yet, and it kind of remains to be seen whether the shift in focus among EPA staff will delay or otherwise impact EPA support of offshore wind permitting and its review of 
um, environmental assessments, the scope of assessments, or the EIS statements. Um, on the other hand, the Council on Environmental Quality, or CEQ, and the Department of Interior, including um, BOEM, appear to be advancing their regulatory agendas in a manner that's pretty much as close to business as usual as possible. Uh, these uh, two agencies are of particular interest because of the role that they play in offshore wind development and the implementation of the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. So with regard to NEPA, for those that are less familiar with the statute, it was enacted in 69 and signed into law by uh, Nixon on uh, January 1st, 1970. And the act actually established the first national policy on environmental issues and was the first med major federal statute uh, in the United States. NEPA is uh, actually the principal U.S. statute that dictates environmental review and permitting for offshore wind projects in U.S. waters. So it's the statute that I'll really focus on for the rest of my discussion. Um, NEPA established the CEQ as the primary federal agency for oversight um, with regard to implementation of NEPA, but um, many of you probably know that Section 388 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 actually gave uh, the Department of Interior and the Secretary uh, in coordination with other agencies, primary authority over offshore wind renewable facilities on the outer continental shelf, uh, including the development and operation of offshore wind. And the Secretary's authority under that act is actually being implemented through the Interior's Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, or BOEM, which is why we talk about that agency quite a bit when we're talking about um, offshore permitting. And because of this dynamic, we're actually more interested from an environmental perspective and how COVID-19 may be impacting BOEM and CEQ uh, rather than its impact on US EPA, which is a little bit more tangential. So as uh, I indicated earlier, well, we can, from all we can tell, the CEQ and uh, Department of Interior, including BOEM, are continuing to operate pretty much business as usual. They're reviewing permits, environmental assessments, their impact statements, um, basically um, any work that's not requiring field work uh, right now, it's just moving along um, at, from dispersed locations, as Belton talked about. Um, it's just being uh, done by the staff from home or wherever they, uh, they are located. And other regulatory developments are also appear to be continuing to move forward as scheduled. On the regulatory front, for example, uh, we know uh, just a few weeks ago, the Department of Interior moved forwards with a proposal to ease protections under the Migratory Bird Act for incidental takes. And CEQ uh, just recently, uh, last month, refused to extend the comment period for some recently proposed amendments to NEPA. So what's important to recognize about NEPA itself um, is that it's intended to really be a procedural statute. It's not supposed to dictate a particular outcome. Um, it's really two, it's two primary purposes are to help educate the agency so that they make better informed decisions and to incorporate some citizen involvement into the decision making process. This is drafted, um, really the goal of NEPA is to require federal agencies to actually consider the environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making a decision. Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, uh, NEPA established the CEQ as the primary agency with oversight. And what that means is that uh, the CEQ establishes guidelines and uh, to advise the other federal agencies. And they do this through both issuing guidance um, and also through their interpreting regulations. But other federal agencies like the Department of Interior um, were required to develop their own regulations and procedures to supplement CEQ's regs. Um, the agency specific regulations are all developed in consultation with CEQ and they're required to be consistent with CEQ's overarching regulations, but um, they are permitted to reflect um, some of the particular mandates and missions of the agency in question. And as I mentioned, the Department of Interior is no different and their regs, if you're interested, are found at uh, 43 CFR part 46. For offshore wind, um, NEPA really comes into play twice. Um, in the development process. And as such, opponents and proponents of offshore wind have two opportunities to influence um, the process and uh, influence uh, you know, how offshore wind is developing. The first is really in connection with the uh, lease sales and the review of site assessment plans. And it's at this point, the public has an opportunity to provide comments, at, uh, typically at stakeholder meetings, um, with regard to how they're scoping the environmental assessment for the lease area. Um, lease sales generally can move forward once the uh, agency has issued an environmental assessment. And at this point, these have all been resulting in FONSIs or findings of um, no significant impact for that for the, when the leases have moved forward. And that was in fact challenged um, back in 2017 in connection with the stat oil lease. Um, 
and the U.S. District Court in 2018 determined that an EIS is not required at that point in time, and that's because um, when uh, the, the leases were being issued and just the site assessment work, it's still not uh, determinative of whether or not a project, an offshore project, is actually going to be developed. And so uh, the agency, um, the, the court approved them just basically finding a FONSI at that point in time and not needing to consider um, what was being incorporated or what needs to be incorporated with regard to the actual development of a, of a project. The second time, however, that NEPA comes into play in the development process is in conjunction with the approval of the construction and operation plans or the COPs. And that's really when the full EIS um, statements need to be developed. And again, the public has an opportunity to participate in that at two different uh, times. One of them is the scoping meeting for the environmental assessment and then providing public comment on the draft EIS. Um, something that's interesting to note and that, you know, that we were asked about and, and Belton actually mentioned is that um, at each of these um, points in time when the public can comment uh, on either the scope of the, EIS, of the environmental assessment or the draft EIS, the regulations don't actually require in-person meetings. Um, I went back and, and double checked both uh, me, uh, CEQ's overarching regs and the Department of Interior's regulations. And just kind of reading from the department's regulations at section uh, 46.305, which is regard to public involvement, they actually state, and I'm going to read from it, the Bureau must, to the extent practicable, provide for public notification and public involvement when an environmental assessment is being prepared. However, the methods for providing public notification and opportunities for public involvement are at the discretion of the responsible official. So um, just taking that one step further, um, what that ultimately means for um, COVID-19 on this process is that we really should not be seeing um, any delays or anything to that extent um, from uh, on the process right now. And that's how it seems to be playing out. Um, with regard to our current situation, at present, as most of you may know, we're at a tipping point for commercial um, offshore wind development with Vineyard Wind uh, waiting for its final uh, EIS so it can move forward. Unfortunately, last summer at the 11th hour, Boehm did make a decision to expand the scope of its review and to conduct an, a supplemental EIS um, to review the cumulative effects for offshore wind projects in the pipeline to the extent that developers um, have negotiated some form of a power purchase agreement. Regulations themselves state that if an agency like EPA fails to submit comments in a in the comment period, however, it shouldn't delay the finalization of the EIS. So again, just because EPA staff may be pulled onto other projects and not focused on what's going on with the EIS or have time to comment on the supplemental EIS or give their input, that again should not be delaying finalization of Vineyard Winds uh, supplemental EIS and hopefully the issuance then of the rod and we can then move forward. Some other good news that's out there is that CEQ appears to be moving forward with the proposed amendments to NEPA. Um, to understand why this is good news, we do need to touch base briefly on problems with NEPA and what CEQ has put forth in its proposal. Uh, the problem with NEPA is that, you know, neither the statute or the subse uh, subsequent guidance or CEQ regs really set a clear limit on the scope of what an agency's environmental review and assessment is supposed to be. And opponents of projects have really taken advantage of this ambiguity and use the NEPA process to block and delay developments, and in some cases causing developers or investors to simply give up on projects. And we did see that, um, in fact, with offshore wind in conjunction with Cape Wind. Um, many of you may know that that uh, project was tied up in litigation for about 16 years, and ultimately uh, the lease was uh, given up for that project. So in an, effect, uh, in an effort to address the situation, uh, President Trump actually issued Executive Order 13807 in 2017 that directed agencies to use a single coordinated process for NEPA um, and to establish a lead agency um, and just to issue a single EIS and ROD for any particular decision or project. And actually later that year, the Department of Interior um, adop uh, adopted uh, another order, uh, number 3355, which was basically to implement um, the executive order 13807, and it included requirements on page limits and, and things like that in the DOI's order. So um, moving into uh, what CEQ just recently proposed um, in January were some modifications of um, the CEQ's overarching regulations with a goal really to reduce the amount of time that it takes to complete an EIS and hopefully reduce the amount of litigation that's been delaying projects over the years. 
um, and just quickly touching on some of the things that are highlighted in the amendments. Um, one of them is that it does it does actually codify a lot of the changes um, or a lot of the directives, I should say, that were in Executive Order 13807, uh, which is the one federal decision, presumptive page limits, and timelines on environmental reviews. Um, it also um, tried to simplify the definition of an environmental effects to be only those that are significant. And this really gets into the more controversial uh, portion of some of the amendments that are that have been proposed. Um, under the definition, the CEQ is proposing to actually exclude um, the terms direct and indirect from the definition of environmental effects. Um, they're planning to strike a separate definition also of cumulative impacts. Um, and requiring that agencies only consider effects that are reasonably foreseeable and have a reasonably close causal connection to a proposed action. The preamble actually um, goes on further to make clear that the analysis of cumulative effects will no longer be required under NEPA and effects should not be considered significant if they're remote in time, geographically remote, or result in a lengthy, ca uh, lengthy causal chain. And what's interesting with that is um, as I mentioned a moment ago with the Vineyard Wind, they're doing this supplemental EIS right now to focus on um, uh, the cumulative uh, effects right now. So hopefully if we move forward, that portion could be eliminated from the regulations. I'm gonna kind of jump quickly through um, some of the other changes and wrap up because I know we're running out of time. Um, so next slide. Uh, just uh, a couple other things that are in the reform is one's requiring the public to be very specific and timely with their comments. Um, and that is basically having agencies request in their notice of intent and have the comment be very specific on their concerns such that at the 11th hour, something can't be raised as a concern and be and cause a delay in the EIS process. And I'm gonna skip over some of these other changes because I know we're running short. Next slide. Um, we are hoping that the uh, um, CEQ will finalize its regs uh, this year. Um, some indicators on that is one, it was highlighted as an uh, important issue in Trump's agenda. The CEQ actually refused to extend its comment period earlier this year and did close comments on March 10th. Um, they did receive a ton of comments, but they can focus on them from their de desk. So hopefully it will be finalized by the end of the year. Going to push this off to Belton right now because I know we're really uh, short on time. And uh, Belton, take take it away. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. That's very helpful. Um, I want to briefly touch on a couple of things um, that are developments that will be helpful to the industry in some cases and not helpful in others. I'll give you all a quick um, synopsis of them, and to the extent we have time, we'll go into more detail. The two items are some recent decisions by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which um, have dealt with the question of how capacity is priced in regional transmission organization capacity markets. Um, the um, their RTOs, regional transmission organizations, that govern the um, of capacity from basically northern North Carolina on the eastern seaboard all the way up through Maine. And the amount of capacity that can be just out now that can be paid for outside of the PPAs that are or that are negotiated with the, um, the as part of the procurement of the resource or that can be passed through to customers by a load serving entity um, depends on the ability to participate in those capacity markets. These are reverse auctions where the highest cost capacity needed to clear the market, the last increment of capacity, sets the price for everyone else. And since fixed capacity is um, fixed, you're going to pay the cost for it whether you get paid by another party or not. It's better to get something or nothing, and it's very much in someone's interest to bid low in hopes that they will be uh, one of the entities that gets some capacity payment as a result of the auction. Well, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has long recognized that this incentive to bid below actual cost can distort markets. And so they've had minimum offer pricing rules in place. Those rules have typically uh, historically had significant exceptions for renewable resources. And FERC, uh, within the last year or so, has begun um, carving back on those exceptions. And the decision uh, with PJM that came out in, in December 
really ended those um, exceptions for the PJM market um, and makes it impossible for offshore wind uh, under those rules to get capacity payments because the, um, the, the minimum offer price, which is based on the actual economics of putting offshore wind capacity in place, just doesn't clear the market. It's basically competing against the cost of gas generation, the capacity cost of gas generation. That has been a very controversial ruling. There have been 50 parties that have filed for reconsideration. Five states have indicated that they are considering asking their utilities to withdraw from PJM as a result of the ruling. It's not clear where it will end up. PJM issued implementing regulations that are a great benefit to the solar and onshore wind markets um, setting, um, you know, but are going to be very difficult. Uh, even under those rules, it will be very difficult for offshore wind projects to qualify for any capacity payments. Uh, we may have, a, may have a, a chance to talk later, but the question becomes, what, uh, what degree have people relied on the possibility of capacity? in pricing these deals. The second regulatory decision, which I'll touch on uh, briefly, are some interpretive regulations under the Jones Act. The Jones Act says that only a US flagged vessel can carry cargo between two points in the United States. Uh, each, in, each monopole installation or each platform in an offshore wind arm is considered a point in the United States. So you cannot carry any material either from a U.S. port to one of these points or between the points as you're going from one monopile to another. Um, there had been some very troubling rulings called the COF rulings that have said that any um, lifting vessel that had to move for any reason, whether it's navigational safety or otherwise, um, if it had U.S. cargo on board and was operating in, in U.S. waters, uh, as part of the lift, it was considered a violation of the uh, of the Jones Act. Um, so if you have um, a piece of equipment hanging from the installation vessel um, crane and the vessel has to move because of some emergency, that would be a, a under the cough rulings, that would be a um, Jones Act violation. That ruling has been withdrawn. Uh, but at the same time, the um, Customs and Border Security withdrew de minimis exceptions for um, de minimis amounts of cargo moved from point to point, which means that when a offshore wind installation is taking place, if you use the typical workaround, you've got a U.S. barge that brings the equipment out and a foreign vessel, because there are no um, U.S. vessels operating that I'm aware of now as real installation vessels. They're very expensive and very technically uh, complex, uh, but the U.S. barge brings the material out and the uh, foreign vessel installs it, that vessel can't have anything on it that um, is going to be left on the seabed or attached to the seabed or part of the ultimate installation. Um, and that means that things like fasteners and shims and connectors and wire have to all stay on the barge from point to point. Um, that Regulatory decision included a new piece of guidance that says basically what I just mentioned, that anything that's left as connected to the seabed should be considered cargo and uh, can't be carried from point to point on a, a non-U.S. vessel. That's the conclusion of the prepared material. I think we are a little bit over time, but uh, Brandon, should we uh, let those who need to leave leave and um, continue with a few questions? Yes, Belton, that sounds great. And I just wanted, first, I wanted to thank Joe, Belton, and Lisa for taking the time today to share your insights on today's webinar. We are running a little bit over, but we feel that the Q&A is important. And we have these three esteemed members of the panel, so we're going to go ahead and take advantage of their time right now. I do have one question that was submitted through the WebEx window from Wayne Cobley. The question is, um, I believe this is for Joe, if a contractor is unable to procure N95 masks within a project schedule, does this meet the impossibility standard? Government restriction also now favors masks being shipped to states and healthcare workers. Joe? Thank you for the, for the question. Um, and like 
every situation of force majeure. Um, it depends. It depends on on the uh, on the applicable law, the state or uh, jurisdiction in which the performance is to be rendered, and the actual clause um, wording in the force majeure um, provision. But in general, I think a, a strong argument could be made that if um, if it is impossible to procure N95 masks, not just difficult, but impossible, to uh to procure them and in many jurisdictions that is in fact the case uh very recent osha um uh regulatory uh easing and interpretations have come out discussing this very issue um they talk about um you know allowing um out of date N95 masks to be utilized uh, and uh, under what circumstances and that the uh, diversion of production and um, and supply of these masks going to healthcare workers being um, being put into place and how you deal with it. I would first look at those OSHA um, OSHA memoranda and interpretive memos to see how how to comply but if in fact you are unable to receive to get the uh, equipment that is needed to safely um, perform your contract i think you would have an arguable um, case that this was within force majeure and it was impossible to perform i think the key issue is to show that the supply was in fact impossible to procure and not just very difficult um, and again, I'd, I'd refer you to some of the OSHA guidelines on those issues. Um, and if you have, if you'd like to reach out to me after the, um, after the webinar, I'd be happy to help point you out into that right direction. Hope that answered the questions. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. Next, I have a question for Lisa. Lisa, would you consider the potential elimination by the CEQ of consideration of cumulative impacts portion of the NEPA analysis? Would you consider that to be positive or a negative influence on the future of U.S. offshore wind and why? Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely view that to be a positive, you know, anything that can speed this along as we know the cumulative analysis is what's delayed um, the review with Vineyard Wind. Um, one thing that I would say with regard to that is that, you know, I would say the cumulative analysis that's being done right now really probably should have been done on a, a programmatic EIS under the current regulations and then tearing off of that. Um, uh, additional projects that are kind of in the pipeline behind Vineyard Wind could tear off of the cumulative analysis that's being done right now. But with that said, um, having, you know, the case law that's kind of pushing for a, a much broader scope cumulative analysis as additional projects get um, you know, power purchase agreements in place or there's addition, uh, additional projects that are being pushed forward, we'll not be able to just rely on the existing cumulative, cumulative analysis as it stands right now. So I would think that you'd still have to have these you know, never ending kind of broad reviews um, unless we can kind of get that out of the regulatory analysis, uh, particularly because a precedent is being set for it right now. So I think it's a positive um, and you know, anything that we can do to kind of narrow down the scope and what is reasonable and foreseeable. Um, I don't think they'll fully go away, but it will narrow the scope of what needs to be. So I think it's a positive. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, I have an initial preliminary question for Belton um, from Jeff Neald. Where might we find more information on the Jones Act discussion uh, that Belton referenced? And that's not a shield question, but we have a, uh, a piece on that uh, that's on our website under my name and others. Um, it's a um, it's a client update. So if you if you Google me and find it, I, I can certainly get it sent out to others um, in the uh, on the list. If, if Brandon, if you could handle that for us, but it gives you an overview. My my comments are a really brief synopsis of what's in about a three page write up on that. Sure, and I have another uh, minimum offer price rule question for you, Belton. Um, you know, some of us are wondering, is is the minimum offer price rule or MOPR ruling from FERC, is it really a big deal for offshore wind? There's a study uh, that was put out by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. The title of that study is, 
estimating the value of offshore wind along the United States East Coast, and I'm quoting from that report when I say this, quote, capacity value is a relatively minor component of the total market value, quote, of an offshore wind project. Could you help us understand that, Belton? Well, yeah, I certainly could. Um, it may be relatively minor, but it probably would be something that the developers would like to have. And the question is, have they built it? Are they, how are they building that into their bids and their, and their, um, their um, spreadsheets for making offers? Um, the um, Vineyard Wind project um, filed some material um, in a dispute it had with ISO New England about getting some capacity payments under an old structure that applied up until a year or so ago. And um, in that case, um, Vineyard Wind would be entitled to claim something between something in the high 30 percent as its total capacity because as we inter, wind is intermittent. They could theoretically bid 30 some odd percent, 35, 37, 38 percent of their capacity into the market. Um, and if you parse the analysis, and I, I can't say that I'm the kind of expert who can do it in, in great detail, but it looks like you're talking, you know, somewhere in the in the eight to ten million dollar a year range would be the value of that capacity. It would have been back at that time. Now the capacity values vary tremendously from year to year, um, so you you really can't uh, come up with a one size fits all calculation. But it's not uh, it's not chump change. There's some value to it, and the question is: Is it compensated through those? Capacity markets as it compensated through the PPAs and other um, structures that are used for um, making the offshore wind projects financeable, or does it simply come out of the developer's pocket? Thanks, Belton. Uh, I'm going to toss this one back to Joe. Um, Joe, for the purposes of force majeure clauses, is there a distinction between impossibility that happens as a result of a governmentally imposed requirement like social distancing? and impossibility that transpires as a result of a company's internal policies or, or decision on how to address something like the coronavirus? Sure, Brandon. Um, I, I think there is. Um, and again, this will be uh, very fact specific, but to the extent that uh, you have a, a uh, ability to have an excuse for force majeure um, due to a, a government order, law, or action, um, uh, preventing your performance um, that usually fits in nicely with with the provisions of force majeure and giving you relief to the extent that you are um, relying on self-imposed uh, restrictions that that are are more narrow than government lawyer uh, orders that are applicable to you well um, well these may be me prudent and uh, and uh, a, a decision that 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 companies will make. Um, I don't think that uh, I think that you have a tougher road to hoe um, in saying that it's within a force majeure provision giving you relief. I wouldn't say that you you don't you arguably don't make the argument um, that uh, that you are going beyond. Uh, what your particular jurisdiction requires. I think factors that would be helpful in the discussion is if you're in a jurisdiction that is not as aggressive as neighboring jurisdictions. Like for instance, uh, Pennsylvania seems to be um, uh, slower to react than than other uh, areas, other jurisdictions in the uh, the Mid Atlantic. Um, if you were to take the same uh, approach as other states in the area and other jurisdictions close by, um, perhaps you can make an argument that uh, that that it was still impossible. But the the key problem with that is almost always with a force majeure claim, it has to be um, not only unforeseeable but outside the control of the effective party. If you think about it, that um, if you could make a self-imposed restriction and that allows it to trigger uh, force majeure, then what what is stopping you from doing that even in the, uh, you know, arguably and, and maybe ridiculously, even if there is no um, uh, huge event of just 
causing a uh, you just restricting your own performance. Um, again, that's that's a bit of an absurd um, uh, example, but you know the the extent that it's um, within your control, um, I think you'll have a harder time to to substantiate that claim. Thanks, Joe. Lisa, I have another question for you. Um, you mentioned before that you thought the elim the potential elimination of the consideration of cumulative impacts was positive. Is there any are there any modifications that have been proposed to NEPA that you're concerned about? I don't think there's any that I'm concerned about. I like the direction that it's going. Um, what I would say is while I think it's a really positive direction on the way that they are trying to narrow the scope on what's considered a significant environmental effect, I don't think that's going to be the end of the story. And I do think um, the language that they have put forth still leaves some ambiguity. And um, I, I don't think they're, you know, closing out um, the fact that there will be litigation or that they're, they're trying to limit it, but I don't think they're, they've successfully done it at this point. Um, so that, that, that would be more of my concern is I don't think they've gone far enough. Um, also, I don't, you know, if they really wanted it to make a real change, they would have some, uh, enforcement provisions within CEQ itself with regard to how the regulations are implemented right now, just a reporting statute and CEQ, um, technically doesn't have any authority other than just providing guidance. Um, and it's the courts that have interpreted, you know, whether or not an agency has in fact, um, you know, complied with its directives or not. Um, but CEQ, you know, has no role in that. And it's just left up to the interpretation of the courts. Thank you. And we still have uh, about 50 participants on. So I have one more question for Belton. Um, Belton, the minimum offer prices are based and, and calculated in part on the technology costs. And as we've seen in Europe, offshore wind project costs continually and often dramatically decline. And we're seeing that, you know, for the most part replicated here in the United States. How is that rapid cost uh, price decline accounted for in the minimum offer price rule? Because that's a long regulatory process that might not keep pace with the, with, uh, the pace of innovation and, and technology change. Good question, uh, but the, the minimum offer prices are determined by the um, RTOs and they're typically updated on a very um, on, on a very short cycle. Typically, um, it can be as, as short as a year and a project can ask for a project specific update if they have a particular technological advance. So you're not locked into the generic if you can show the generic number is too high for your project. You know, the, the perversity of it is that uh, it's all about capacity. And if you're competing against natural gas, um, the cost is all in the natural gas, not in the capacity to build the natural gas um, turbine facility. And it's the exact opposite with offshore wind. The cost is in the capital and there's zero fuel cost associated with it. So offshore wind comes in at a, at a great disadvantage. Ultimately, the problem is that carbon is not priced in the United States. And so the carbon advantage of uh, of offshore wind doesn't show up anywhere in those uh, calculations. All right. Well, thanks very much, Belton. And I'd also like to thank um, again our panelists, Joe Taroni, Belton Ziegler, and Lisa Rushton from Wobble Bond Dickinson for joining us for today's webinar. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights about these really relevant issues that are continually developing and and will continue to inform the development of the U.S. offshore wind industry. At this time, we're going to close the webinar. We'd like to thank everyone for participating and attending, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.